I'm going to be talking about a painful subject for a lot of us, taxation. Uh, unfortunately, we have as citizens in democracies the responsibility to figure out fair tax systems, and that has an awful lot to do with trust. Uh, we're not very far from a tax haven. If you read the Apple headlines and the uh, stories about Google and uh, Microsoft and Facebook, 80 of the top 100 uh, multinational companies in the world actually use the Netherlands as a kind of pass-through vehicle uh, for reducing their taxation substantially, to the point where Apple basically spent, uh, 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 ended up uh, earning just about, uh, point, about $100 billion tax-free profits uh, in the last three years by virtue of these games. So the um, basic story is that this has an awful lot to do with trust, that there's a global haven industry uh, that is specialized in making these practices possible, that it pertains not only to sheltering the income of wealthy corporations, but also individuals. Uh, in aggregate, we estimate that there is now about 21 to 32 trillion dollars offshore untaxed of private financial wealth beyond the reach of, uh, of, of tax authorities. And that's having a profound effect, especially in the developing world, where they're forced to borrow or rely on aid or natural resources, uh, as opposed to taxing their wealthiest citizens. But this has come back to haunt the first world as well, and we're seeing massive amounts of tax evasion uh, going on in the first world in the United States and Europe as well. And it's, this topic is really hot right now. The OECD and the G8 and the G20 are all meeting on this uh, in the next six months, and we're hoping to push through uh, some reforms. So I'm going to be highlighting just three quick examples of the kind of abuses we're talking about, and then understanding a little bit, helping us understand a little bit about what this has to do with um, tax with uh, trust and fiscal justice. If this would work, it isn't. Um, next slide, there we go. So economists tend to talk about social value of trust. Um, and this is an eye chart, I don't expect you to read it, but basically what it says is there's three dimensions we really care about. There's an economic value of having trust as a social good that's available to everyone, that can be contagious, um, that basically facilitates a lot of the business transactions we engage in. It's called the fourth factor of productivity uh, by economists. Uh, if you have a society based on trust, you have better partnering, you have uh, uh, less waste, less inventory, you can count on receiving the goods that you asked for on time, and you have people focusing on real innovation as opposed to uh, uh, regulatory mining, and you have better regulations as well. Politically, it's even more important. Uh, if we think of society as, uh, in Rawls' term, terms, a fair sh scheme of cooperation, uh, if we have a society in which citizens can expect justice uh, and due process of law, and that political decisions are made to reflect their wishes, uh, as opposed to being available to the highest bidder, then we have a society that's more likely to have better growth and healthier democracy. Um, so my, sustain my hypothesis uh, for this talk is that sustainable market democracies require us to worry about the social value of trust. We have countries that are trapped in a, what we call, low trust uh, trap in which basically they have to rely, if they're trying to collect taxes, what we call the doomsday book model. 13th century, the king went around England and it was the, the worst day in a peasant's life to see the tax collectors come because they were making inventory of everyone's wealth. That was much easier to do in the 13th century than it is now. Uh, there weren't havens to run to, and there weren't the kind of sophisticated mechanisms for transferring wealth offshore. But we see uh, this, this challenge for countries that are developing to develop uh, uh, tax systems that are based on compliance that's voluntary and willful. Uh, and we actually see some trend in the first world toward lower trust, so that concerns us. 
and it's having a, a big impact on, on everyone in the current crisis because a lot of the costs of government, the essential services that we consume, uh, are being transferred to the poor and the middle class. So the Apple story has recently hit the headlines, and Apple's a case of uh, what we call multinational uh, tax dodging. Basically, they've arranged their business system so they are able to transfer a lot of their intellectual property, uh, their brands and software, their most valuable corporate assets, uh, to low tax havens like Ireland, Bermuda, uh, and using the Netherlands as well. Um, last year, they paid, they parked about 64% of their global profits offshore. In this case, we see, you know, they actually employ 65,000 workers in the United States, um, but uh, they really employ about 1.2 million people in China who are, uh, who are producing all their stuff. Uh, and that, that uh, workforce is receiving for, the, for all that uh, value about uh, a little less than 10% of the total value added created. And much of the residual is being transferred to low tax havens. So that's an example. There's many others that we could talk about uh, where multinationals are doing that. To make this a little clearer, I mean, the first point is, is, uh, is important to make that this is uh, a new business for corporations to mine the tax code and to transfer uh, money offshore so that it's allowed them to become, uh, to pay much lower corporate tax rates. So we've seen a dramatic drop in the effective rate of corporate taxation in every country. There's a race to the bottom uh, which is really having a disastrous effect on, on first world countries as well as uh, developing countries. Uh, let me give you an example, not from the software industry, but from the banana industry, about how this kind of intra-company trade game is played. You start with bananas in Ecuador, produced for 13 pence export. About one P of that goes taxable profits. This is in pounds. They set up a subsidiary, the Banana Cartel, in the Cayman Islands to charges for use of the purchasing network. They have another uh, subsidiary. Amazing technology. Uh, in Luxembourg, which charges 8p for financial services per pound. Uh, this goes on to Ireland, charged for the brand, Another subsidiary of the cartel in, uh, in the Isle of Man charges 4P for insurance. Uh, and all of this is beyond the reach of auditing. There is no competitive market. Uh, the so-called arm's length standard for transfer pricing is allowed to game this system because uh, the, the companies are allowed to set up subsidiaries without any activity in these havens and transfer income to those subsidiaries and pay no taxes on the, uh, on the income that's transferred, and to also charge themselves all these intermediate expenses. Jersey, Bermuda, they're all involved. And finally, by the time it gets to the UK, we have uh, an import price of 60p compared to the export price of 13, and almost all of it has been eaten up in these bogus intermediate services charges that are determined by the companies themselves. Very hard for tax auditors to get at. Here's a second example, Zambia. In the case of Zambia, we have copper exports channeled through Swiss companies. They're parking all of the exports in low tax havens. So Zambia shows positive exports on the average of uh, about $10 billion a year through Switzerland, but Switzerland shows no imports from Zambia. If Zambia got the same price for its copper that the Swiss do, who are selling it for them, Zambia's GDP would increase by at least 25%. Now, a second aspect of this that's terribly important, I referred to earlier, the 21 to 32 trillion offshore, has to do with global private banking. And this is a business that you can associate with players that we all know and love from the financial crisis. The leaders in this market are basically helping wealthy people around the planet move their money offshore, conceal it, manage it, and, uh, and protect it against taxation 
They're the same people that got bailed out in the 2008 crisis. They're the same folks that have been engaged in any number of scandals since there with LIBOR rigging, money laundering. They're the UBS, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, HSBC. Uh, these are the same players, by the way, that were also involved in the third world debt crisis. So they account globally for about half of the $12 trillion that is now assets under management and deposits that are managed by these banks. So that's a second major hole in the international tax system. Uh, we have estimated those based on a number of different me uh, methods. Um, uh, for the developing world, you find the situation where collectively they own about 9.4 trillion of the 21 to 32 trillion, about a third. Uh, in addition to that, they have about $6.5 billion of offshore official reserves. And on the other hand, they have about $4.8 billion of debt. So if you offset that, you see that the developing world, low and middle income countries collectively, are lending to the first world to the tune of about $11 trillion. The debt problem is not a debt problem. It is a tax problem. It's the inability of these countries to tax first world uh, private bankers and the assets that are accumulated in places like Switzerland and the United States and uh, the UK, effectively. If their money were repatriated, they could pay off, easily pay off, all the big countries involved in owning this could easily pay off any foreign debts that they have. They're all net creditors. Globally, the impact of this on the global wealth distribution of all this missing wealth, which belongs to the top 0.14% of the population, is dramatic. All of our statistics on income and wealth inequality that we've been talking about using fancy analytical methods, that's great, I love it. Um, the numbers are flaky. When you look deeper into what's going on, there's an enormous amount of wealth that is off the books, uh, not even in bank deposits. In, it's in vaults in Switzerland. There's a huge network of underground vaults uh, holding gold and diamonds and art, none of it accountable and none of it uh, to be picked up by automatic information exchange. Um, the, collectively, you have about 10 million people on the planet uh, who own a net worth of at least a million dollars. The happy few who own 30 million or more account for about 30% of uh, all of the, uh, uh, of the global net financial wealth. Um, and the global elite in total accounts for about 81% of it, and almost all of the 21 to 32 trillion of offshore wealth. So to summarize, as Brecht once said, it is capitalism that is truly radical. It's become more radical since the 70s, when there were 15 havens. Today, there's 73. Uh, this is a huge business. It has to be treated as a business and as an industry, and not as an archipelago of individual havens to be reformed. Netherlands may be a haven for certain purposes. The United States is a haven for certain purposes. Switzerland's a great big haven. There's Jersey and BVI and Caymans. We can go on and on. The world community is only waking up to the fact that in the background, behind all of these individual sovereign jurisdictions, which have been trading their sovereignty in exchange for this kind of mess of pottage, uh, are these uh, global players who are much more influential in politics, uh, as well as in economics than they deserve to be. I'm going to go into this business. This is great. The last topic I um, want to talk about is to go back to the debt crisis. I spent a lot of time auditing what happened to the $6.8 trillion. And the story is basically a long one. But uh, I don't have time to go into it today. I'd invite you to, to ask me about where we can find out more. It's an incredible story. Every country had a different phenomenal amount of story. The basic bottom line is 6.8 trillion went in, in constant dollars, and very, very, almost all of that was wasted in lousy projects, corruption, and capital flight. At the end of that period, we granted 10% of that as debt relief, $300 billion, compared to which the current bailouts for financial co companies uh, you know, are 10 times 
that level or more. And uh, half of that relief came from the Soviet Union for giving their loans. And you also had corrupt privatizations all over the world as a result of that problem. Um, so now we have this, in the last minute, uh, I'll come back to the, 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 where we are today with respect to trust. We have a globalization crisis that's gone from the developing world to the first world, heavily indebted rich countries. You have first world capital flight. You have uh, third world bankers coming to the United States and asking them to move their money to Brazil, asking us to move their money to Brazil. You have growing inequality worldwide, not just in the uh, developing world. So what do we do about this? There's a long list of things. This is affecting trust. It is basically a rigged game that people are seeing uh, uh, proliferating all over the planet. And it's time for us as ordinary citizens to get involved. We can no longer assume that our elected officials uh, will, will take charge and take care of this on their own. As William James, the pragmat pragmatist, said, uh, democracy begins with an act of faith. That fundamentally, we have to take it on faith that we can change this world. 